Jesus, and we lift you up and exalt you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. A glimpse of heaven. We just get a glimpse. You know, the Bible, see, the Bible says that eye has not seen, neither hath ear heard, nor ha have it, has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. So we're not going to be able to comprehend fully or understand everything about heaven. That's why God just gives us a little glimpse or a snapshot. Because we can't really fathom. You know, when we think about heaven, it's kind of like if you used to compare, if you, if you used to try to describe to someone a three-dimensional world that we live in, and you used to try to describe it to someone who lived in a two-dimensional world, it would be very hard to describe something as simple or, and basic as a ball. You, if you were to try to describe to someone that lived in a two-dimensional world, it's just like a sheet of paper, basically. They live in just a two-dimensional world. We live in three-dimensional, so it has the depth. So if you, to, if you were to try to describe a ball, when it enters into their world, it'll enter as just a dot, and then it would go like this. To us, we see the whole, you know, so it's, it would be hard to describe how you could throw it, how you could dribble it, and, you know, because there'd be like, it, it would be hard for them to understand that. Now, we don't know if heaven is going to be four dimensional or m multi dimensional or whatever, but we know that it is going to be very different than what we are experiencing here. Now, if you, if you would try to describe to a baby, if you could communicate to a baby in, within the, his mother's womb, and you try to describe for him what it's like out here, because he's, be, well, he's content in there. He's warm. He get, you know, has all the food. You know, he gets fed through the umbilical cord. He's comfortable. And yet he's all squished up, upside down. And, and if you were to try to describe a color, when we come out here, you can see the, the green grass and the blue sky. How would you explain that to a baby? Or how, you know, you'd be able to move around and walk, walk. You know, they wouldn't even be able to understand. So in a way, it's kind of like that, that we on this side of eternity are very limited in, in how God could communicate heaven. But he does, and he gives us chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation. There's other places, of course, in the scriptures, but most of them deal with the millennial kingdom. Now, keep in mind, we, we already discussed the millennial kingdom. That we're going to be there with Jesus, and we're going to rule and reign in the millennial kingdom for 1,000 years. This is after that. A lot of when you talk to a Jehovah's Witness, they always are focusing on inheriting the earth. They're always focusing on the millennial kingdom passages. They can't comprehend or fathom this, and they don't even think, if you ask them, if you try to witness a Jehovah's Witness and you to ask them you know, if they know for sure they're gonna, if they're going to make it to heaven, a lot of times they're going to say, well, I'm not going to go to heaven. Only 144,000, I'm not of, I am not of the little flock. And they have these passages of scriptures and that, that's all just twisted and distorted. And they're, they are, they understand that they're going to inherit the earth. And then they'll show you all the passages of scriptures that deal with the millennial kingdom. But this passage of scripture is not that. <laughs> it's very clear to me that this is not the millennial kingdom. This is after. So you'll see it in English right? <laughs> you'll see it right here in English but if not you know we would go over a couple of Hebrew words you know just in case you speak Hebrew it's funny when somebody wants a code you know a secret code and yet it's just we gotta have the Da Vinci code and the secret code so we can know what the Bible is to just re read it in English if that's what you understand is English okay first we just have two points so it should be pretty brief a brand new heaven. And what's the second point? A bright new city. That's it, two points. A brand new heaven. Verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So is that clear enough? <laughs> 
I saw a new heaven. Now, if I, let's say if one day I drove our car to an um, auto body shop, you know, and we fixed all the scratches and dents, which there's like 100 million on our car. We s- fixed them all up. You know, when someone opens the door and hits the car, sorry, I don't worry, it matches the rest of it. <laughs> so it don't matter too much, really. You know, I remember thinking, I never wanted to have a car that I'd stress out when someone opened the door. And when we bought this car, it was the only brand new car I ever bought. And when I remember when buying it, and um, they brought the car to us, and there was like a scratch on it. I said, man, this car's already scratched, you know. I'm buying a brand new car. I don't want one that's scratched. And I remember the guy kind of looked at me like, okay. Kind of like in, with a smirk thinking, this is going to get so scratched up anyway. So then he got me another car with no scratches, and in no time it gets scratched. In fact, I was telling people, when you buy a brand new car, you should just get a hammer and just kind of smash it a little bit. That way, get it over with. Because <laughs> people are going to dent it. and it's just. Gonna. But if I got our car that was all scratched up and stuff, and I took it to an auto body shop, and I had, it ripped, I had it fixed up, and I had it, you know, body worked and painted with a brand new color on it and kind of cleaned the interior, had them detail it. And then I brought the car home, and I said, Rock, that's what I call Roxanne, Rock. Rock, I got a brand new car. And she looked out there and saw the same car, but it had a paint job. Would she think that that was a brand new car? There, is there a difference between a brand new car and a car that you just fix up? Yes. So why would we think that this is a remodeled, renovated earth? It just doesn't say that. I think someone wants to come in. I don't know. So. <laughs> no? no? Okay. I don't know if he was like a bouncer there or something. It says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Now, if I took our new car, and some people call insurance hit, yeah? (laughs) And I drove up the H3 or something, and or probably wouldn't work there, maybe the Pully Lookout or something, and put it in drive and and put a brick on the gas pedal, and that car sailed over the Pully. Would you ever expect to see that car again? If you did, it would be, you know, it's in rubble. Well, look at what happens to our earth. Second Peter 3, verse 12 and 13 says, Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. It is completely new. The old one is burned up. The elements have melted. We talked about this before, that the elements are all held together by the strong force. I don't know if anybody looked that up. Is it really called the strong force? Yeah, it is. You look at that um, strong force that holds the protein, which are positively charged um, in the the nucleus of an atom. They have a positive charge of protons. Scientists don't know. It it boggles their mind how they're kept together because positively charged will always repel. But there is a what they call strong force. Sometimes they have another, you know, like the nuclear force or whatever. The strong force that holds all those proteins, protein molecules together is Jesus Christ. When he lets it go, it is going to just blow. Like an atom bomb, when it splits the atom and it has a chain reaction, that's what the bomb does. So imagine when all the atoms are let go, it's just going to be one big massive explosion. And that's the end of this earth. Now, the millennial kingdom is going to be a thousand years, but there's still going to be that residual effects. And even though there's, there's, it's going to be a wonderful time, I mean, there's going to be people that come in to the millennial kingdom. They survive the tribulation period. They're going to live a thousand years. They're going to reproduce. There's going to be a whole lot of people there. They're going to have to get saved. And some are going to follow the devil at the end. And they're going to, they're, they're, they're going to be judged and sent to hell. But after that, this takes place. That is what's going to be destroyed. And there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Now it says in, in Isaiah 65 verse 17. It speaks of this. It says for behold I create 
new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, no, nor come into mind. So when we're in heaven, when we come to this place in heaven, we're not even going to be able to remember the former things. Because if we could, it would be too difficult. If you would think about the people that are not there, you know, you think about a loved one who you don't see there. So God is going to, he's going to wipe our memory of all the former things. That's the only way we're going to be able to truly enjoy heaven. It says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered. Now, this word create here is the Hebrew word bara. And that word means to create out of nothing. So that means it's entirely new. It's not a renovated earth and a reno renovated heavens. Now, when we're talking about heavens, this is, there's three parts that when the, when the Bible speaks of heaven, it can also be referring to the place where the birds fly, the sky. It can also be referring to outer space, and some would refer to it as the night sky. And then there's a place where God lives. And now it's not talking about that part. It's just talking about the parts that we experience and what we see, the sky and the, the outer space, basically, and this earth. All of that is going to be blown up, and there's going to be a new one. So that word bara is the same word that... The Bible uses in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. Same word there. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So don't think that this earth is going to be here forever. It's going, it's going to blow up. That's why don't take, don't, we can't put our roots and sink them down too deep here on earth. Because this is all temporary. And I think that sometimes when Christians live a defeated life is because they focus all their time and attention on, on this world and this world is not our home we're just passing through and the more we understand that the more we can grasp that and get that into our heart and into our soul the more joy we'll experience in this world that's why the bible says lay not up for yourselves treasures upon this earth where moth and rust does corrupt and thieves do break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and thieves do not break through and steal. And then it says, for where your treasure is, there will, you, will your heart be also. And if your treasures are invested in this earth, then your heart's going to be in this earth, and it's going to be like this. My team wins, I'm happy. My team loses, I'm mad. My team wins, I'm happy. My team loses, I'm mad. My team, or stock market up, start. That's why, you know, that's why we're always in bad moods, right? Yeah. Because our team's always losing all days, right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But stock market's up, happy. Stock market's down. Promotion, happy. Lose a job, sad. Car, you know, a brand new car, happy. And then um, someone smashes it, is upset. You know, and that's because our treasures is on these things. You know, and, and um, children is behaving good, everything's good, happy. Some child gets a bad grade or, or is, does something in school to get suspended and now, it, you know, ruins my day. And that's because sometimes we take, too much attention and take it too serious, the things that go down on this earth. We need to be living for heaven. We need to get our eyes in heaven. And when we're in heaven for just a few hours, the things that we went through in this world is not even going to be, the Bible says, the sufferings of this present time are not even worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. And there's some serious sufferings that goes on in this world that tells you how glorious heaven will be. If there's not even a comparison, and some people go through some difficult sufferings on this world and yet the bible says it can't even be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in heaven so it says here there is no more sea so can you imagine that and you're gonna the, the bible does talk about bodies of water in um the millennial kingdom but there's not going to be any sea to the jews the sea was a place of separation and evil in the book of Revelation, we see the beast comes from there. It says in the notes, false prophet, that's not. He comes from the earth. And also, the, it's the place of the dead in Revelation 20, 13. In other passages of Scripture, the sea is associated with the heathen and a place where, where the Lord's enemies will be conquered. And there's not going to be any more sea. That's where all the storms come from, from the sea. And it says in verse 2, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared 
as a bride adorned for, for her husband. I've heard people say this, that the city of Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. And they take it from this verse and another one that we'll see in a minute. And um, I don't believe that to be so. The church is the bride of Christ, but this is where the bride will live. And so he's describing it. And sometimes when you see John is trying to describe something so beautiful and he's trying his best. So he's just using something that we can relate to. So probably the most beautiful picture that he can think of is when a bride comes down the aisle and the the husband to be and they're about to get married is looking at his bride who he's about to marry. And she's so beautiful, and he's so much in love with her. And the day has finally come where they're going to be wed. And he sees her for the first time in her in her wedding dress. Well, supposedly he's supposed to wait, right? He's not supposed to see the bride before um, before this time. And he sees her for the first time, and he's just in awe at her beauty. Did you go to the wedding with? <laughs> you seen Mike up there? He could he could hardly compose himself, man? He's just breaking down, you know. I was like, Micah, come on, man up, bro. Come on, man. <laughs> You're making us men look bad, bro. <laughs> it's just falling up, apart, you know, on there. And, um, and here comes Kimi down the aisle, right? So he's describing that. But that's how it is at all weddings, right? You see that, that first glimpse when uh, I remember, you know, when we got married. I mean, it's, you just, I mean, you know what she looks like already. But then, you know, I don't know. They have this, like, transformation process they go through. And, <laughs> and it, it takes, it, oh, <laughs> think of think of when I was playing football. Think of when I was playing football. <laughs> and you know, they go through this transformation. It takes a long time. I mean, it takes about ten hours. I mean, they wake up at like two a.m. You know, they're getting ready. They've been getting ready and far in advance with all of the stuff. And the day comes, and this whole team comes. I mean, it's like, man. It, I mean, there's more preparation that goes in there than part of the Super Bowl halftime show. You know, and they're coming in there and they're getting everything ready. And there's people. And there's. I mean, I walk into our, our house and I was like, wow, man. We got several bathrooms in our house, and there was not one available, you know. And I had about what, I don't know, eight minutes to get ready, you know. <laughs> so we got to be, we got to be at the church in like uh, half an hour. And I'm just getting home, you know. And and there's just, you know, that, there's a lot of preparation that goes in that moment. So John is saying, that's what it was like when he sees this, this city coming down as a bride before her husband, and and he's describing it in the the. Uh, the most descriptive way that he could as a human being. It's kind of laugh. Well, I don't say laughable, but when someone would try to argue that point, they got these two verses and they're going to stick with it. You know, the, that this city is the bride of Christ, a creation, you know, that's not even personable. But anyway, I've heard people argue that point. So I just, I just figured I'd say that just in case. Now the next verse, of course, is going to give them more, uh, um, a stronger argument. Well, we'll see that in a minute. So I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven. I mean, we hear the voice of God. I think this is the only time you, you'll see this. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. The tabernacle, or the temple, represented the presence of the Lord on the earth. But now we see not just the representation. We see the real, the reality of his presence, not just a representation of his presence. And it says... The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So this speaks of God's ultimate purpose for man. That is to fellowship with God. That is God's ultimate purpose for us. It's not for you to be a football star. Or a basketball star. Or a multi-millionaire. I mean, if you can do all those things. In fact, you know, we are looking for a quarterback right now. You're good at throwing a ball. Anyway, that's not the purpose for us. I mean, we can enjoy a lot of things on this earth. But we start to get frustrated. And we start to get depressed. And we start to feel empty when we start to live for something that is not really 
our purpose in life. And if we're not careful, and I see this a lot in my life and in the life of others, that our life seems to be so much other than fellowship with God. That's when you got to kind of like pull teeth just to get someone to come to church. They've missed it. To pull teeth to get someone to study or read the Bible or to uh, live, live out the truths of Scripture. And that's why we sometimes seldom share Jesus Christ with others because he's not on our heart much. You and I share what's on our heart, by the way, N normally. Remember that next time you're mad at somebody, you're going to share it with somebody else, right? I mean, that's just natural unless you get right with the person. What's on our heart just seems to come out of our mouth, right? If Jesus is on our heart, he'll come out of We'll speak of him to others. It's just natural. The best preview you and I can get of heaven is a close walk with the Lord through Jesus Christ. That's a preview of heaven. You know, um, if you want to know what the heavenly life is like, walk close to Jesus. You think, that's boring. The holy life is, no. That's the heavenly life. The devil has sold us on a bill of goods thinking that you would have more fun in a sporting event or a movie than you would at church worshiping the Lord in, in a true sense of worship. That something that's going to encourage you in the things of God is boring or something that I really don't want to do, but I'd rather do something that's just entertaining. We think that that's really true. And that's not for the Christian. But the greatest thing about the Garden of Eden was not that it was such a lush, green, beautiful, tropical paradise. But the, the best thing about Eden was the fact that they fellowship with God himself in the morning, in the cool of the day. That's what, that's what the best thing about Eden was. And so now here, we know that Eden was lost, but now it has been regained in its ultimate fulfillment. Where we are able to fellowship again with him for all of eternity. And now because of that, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. The former things are passed away. There's not going to be, I mean, any more tears, no more pain, no more death. I know all of us have been through difficult times. Some people have been through such horrendous times. Some people have experienced excruciating pain. Some people have experienced tremendous loss, a loss of a loved one, a loss of a child, a loss of a spouse. But we know that when we suffer loss, it is because we live on this earth, a place of death, a place of sin and decay, a place where we will not be forever. And one day we're going to be in heaven and none of this will, will be a part of it. And that's almost like a close relationship with Jesus Christ. When we, are so, when we are close with him, he will comfort us in the times of difficulty. And he will go through the valleys with us. And he will help us and encourage us in the times where we're, when we're down. And that's the preview of the heavenly life. Some of the greatest things about the new Jerusalem is what it does not have. It does not have any tears. No sorrow, no death, no pain. Later on in the chapter, we're going to see that it has no temple. There's not going to be a need of a temple because he's going to be there in, in, in all of his reality, in, in all of his realness. There's going to be no sacrifice, no sun, no moon, no darkness, no sin, and no evil. You say, no sun? How's it going to be like? Do you know that if you read the book of Genesis, there was light before the sun was even around? <laughs> Let there be light, that was the first day. Sun, moon, and stars, that was day four. <laughs> the, the Lord does not need the sun for light. He is light. And in him is no darkness at all. I want to read this. No tears. Every tear, for there be many. Tears of bereaved affliction, such as Mary and Martha, and the widow of Nain wept. Tears of sympathy and mercy, such as Jeremiah and Jesus wept over the sins and calamities of Jerusalem. Tears of persecuted innocence, tears of contrition and penitence for faults and crimes against the goodness of 
of the majesty of heaven. Tears of disappointment and neglect. Tears of yearning for what cannot now be ours. These and whatever other, whatever other ever course the cheeks of mortals shall then be dried forever. No more tears. Verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. I don't know if when the voice spoke, if John was kind of startled. He says, he says and, he sat, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he's supposed to write it down. And he's like, What? He goes, Write it. <laughs> oh, he makes all things new. Because that's the thing about this world. Now, like I said, in, in our whole marriage, in my whole life, really. We bought one brand new car. It's still out there, by the way. It doesn't look like it used to look when it's brand new. When you buy something new, what happens? It doesn't stay new, right? And there's nothing like a new car smell. And our car has long since lost that new car smell. But there's nothing like, I mean, I don't know if they can make a fragrance that you can. They have one. I wonder if it's really, if it actually really smells like a new car. No. Doesn't he tried it? Didn't help, huh? No, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. New car smell. Now. I thought you sprayed them on yourself. I thought, I thought you sp- So you wasn't spraying them on for the daughter, huh? Yeah. There's nothing like a new car. That new car smell. I don't know what it is. It's, it's like the glue or something. I don't know what it is. It just, wow, it smells so awesome. And then what happens? I remember, you know, when we had first bought our new car. It was just days. And one of our children, not to, not to mention which one, but she does live in Texas, <laughs> was eating. What were you eating? She was eating raw fish or something. She was eating something. And while she drove it, and it goes on in between the seats. You know how it is? I was like, wow, what happened to her? Usually a new car smell going to last a little while. Now it smells like rotten fish. <laughs> Kylie said, oh, sorry, Daddy. Yeah, I dropped some fish down in the... Did you clean? Yeah, I cleaned the room. <laughs> You're leaving. I, I they like when they get to be sermon illustrations. But I just thought, I just remembered that right now about the new car smell. But you know in heaven... Everything is always new. I mean, you know when you have, a, when, when there's a brand new house, a brand new vehicle, or your clothes is brand new. There's something about something that's new. And then it gets old. Like us. <laughs> Take a picture of my sons and I'm like, man, I got to make my beard black again somehow. <laughs> it just looks so different when I'm next to them, you know. And we get old, right? That's just a reminder. This world is not our home. This body's not going to be the body I'm going to be living in for all of eternity. Praise the Lord. I went hiking the other day. went to Makapu Trail. And my brother, who lives in uh, Colorado, high altitude. So over here, low altitude, it's like, man, you can just, you know, you're, you're so much more in shape because you're used to the thinner air or whatever. So that's the only way I can explain it. Because I'm like, he's just running up the mountain like a billy goat. And I'm just like, <laughs> took me about three days to recover. You know, but this is not the body we're going to be in for all of eternity. We're going to have a new body. Praise the Lord for that. And every time you have an ache or a pain, that's a reminder. You're not going to be in this body forever. One day you'll be in heaven. Be encouraged. And that's how it's going to be. And he says this in the present tense. Not just he makes it new and then it starts to get old. It's always new, every moment. And that's how we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, our body, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Do you know that we can be renewed spiritually day by day? We can be renewed every single day, every single moment. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And that's not our physical body, obviously. But the Holy Spirit's given to us as a down payment that one day we're going to have a new body. Verse 6. 
And he said unto me, it is done. He already says it is finished, but now he says it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the, fount of, of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We are going to inherit all things. You might not have ever received any kind of inheritance before, but you're going to if you are a believer. We're going to inherit all things. It's really sad when you see these people that are very wealthy on this earth, if they're not believers. It's really sad. They die, and that's it. I mean, the best days of their life is over. And for a lot of people, the best days of their life are already over. Even on this earth, they're always looking back at the time that they were the most famous. You ever um, hear uh, or, or, or read an interview from a famous athlete or a movie star? Someone who at one time was considered the most beautiful or the most famous or the best or the most talented or gifted actor or actress. And then after a while, you know, they, people don't care about them anymore. You know, and society kind of chews them up and spits them out and just doesn't care. And they tell their stories, and it's really sad. The best days of their life were the days in the past. I remember talking to Colt Brennan when he was in a hospital. You know, and he was struggling with addiction. He was in a hospital. He couldn't, his hands weren't working right. He couldn't feed himself. And I was trying to, someone wanted me to go and encourage him and try to win him to Christ. And I went over there and, and I, I was trying to talk to him about the Lord. He didn't, he was being as cordial as he could to me, but he, he was saying, I just, some other time, I, I, I can't really, um, you know, he's trying to be nice to me. He knows I was a pastor. And I wanted to encourage him. So I thought maybe I'll just talk, you know, cheer him up. And, and I said, yeah, I just wanted to thank him for, um, the perfect season, you know, we had season tickets that year, and, and we appreciate what he did. And he goes, you know, I don't want to talk about football. He says, my life was so great then, and now look. I was like, there's just there's nothing that I could do. And I never got to talk to him after that, never seen him again. They're trying to get him into the RAM program, but he never, it never worked out. And then, of course, you know that he had passed away. And I hope that he, I hope that someone, you know, that, um, or he was able to remember some of the things I tried to tell him that short time, or whoever else tried to witness to him that he turned to Christ at some point. But if not, and he's spending eternity in, in, in hell forever. And that's really sad. God's eternal purpose in Jesus is now accomplished. It says in Ephesians 1.10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. And it says there that, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Drinking and thirst are common pictures of God's supply and man's spiritual need. As he told the woman at the well, you're going to just drink this uh, regular water. You're going to thirst again, but the water that I shall give shall spring up in him a, a, a well of living water, and he shall never thirst. And she said, oh, I want, that. I want a drink of that water. Now, speaking of eternal life. Drinking is an action, but an action of receiving like faith. It is doing something, but not based upon works. It's based upon faith. If you're going to get saved, it is by faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the what? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What does a thirsty man do to get rid of his thirst? He drinks. Perhaps there is no better representation of faith in all the word of God than that. To drink is to receive, to take in the refreshing drought, and, and that is all. A man's face may be unwashed, and yet he can drink. He may be a very unworthy character, but yet a draught of water will remove his thirst. His thirst. Drinking is such a, a remarkable, easy thing. It is even more simple than eating. And we'll get to drink of that water forever. But the fearful and unbelieving and, the, and abominable, you, th you think it says fearful. What are people afraid of? Why are people afraid to get saved, you know? And, and I, I can imagine, you know, thinking back, you're thinking that if I get saved, then, and I have Jesus in my life, he's not going to let me do things that I like doing. He's not going to let me be what I want to be. And he's going to make me, to become 
a monk. And I'm going to be sitting in church with my hands folded, saying, um, I'm a monk. I just sit here all day. You know, sometimes we get the, a strange picture of what we think holiness is. And having been raised, you know, in the beginning of, of my life in the Catholic Church, I used to see that. There was nothing in what I saw of any priest I've ever met that I thought I want to be like that. Never. And if you're a Christian that goes around always in a bad mood, always grouchy, nobody wants Jesus from, no, nobody, nobody wants to be like that. They don't say, man, look at that Christian. I want, man, I want what they got. If we walk around miserable, upset, complaining, if we're a complainer, you're on the job around lost people complaining all the time. They don't want what you got. We need to be a good advertisement for who Jesus is and what it's like to be a Christian. And when you and I walk close to the Lord, that's, what's, that's what people's going to see. It's going to affect our countenance. It's going to affect our personality. It's going to affect our spirit. It's going to affect us in our family. It's going to affect us with our children, with our spouses. Now, we're not going to always be perfect. I mean, you know, only few of us can be that way. Nah. Now, here I got my mom. I got my wife. They're, they're like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, you grouchy too. That's because you guys know. <laughs> you make me grouchy. It's like Pastor Mark when someone said, you make me grouchy. He says, you make me happy. I said, that's the that's a best line, Pastor Mark, man. <laughs> you make me so mad. You make me so happy. <laughs> try that one, Yukion Jensen. Try that one. <laughs> that still can be taken as a smart attic remark, though, you know. But not the way Pastor Mark says it. Pastor Mark says it so nicely, you know. That's why he's doing the Proverbs. Wisdom. I tell you, when I grow up, I want to be like Pastor Mark. For real. When I grow up, I want to be like Pastor Mark. I'm not being sarcastic, man. Don't laugh. Don't laugh, I said. For real. The fearful and unbelieving and abominable. You know, I, and, and I read that, I'm thinking... If people really knew what it, what it was like, and, you know, maybe they would know more of it if we kind of, like, sold them on it, right? But there's a lot of people are afraid. They're afraid to get saved. They'll sit in the services and think, I don't want to get saved, man. That would be the, I don't want us. I want to go to heaven, but I don't, I don't want Jesus. You cannot have heaven without Jesus. Heaven is Jesus. <laughs> he that has the Son hath life. He that has not the Son of God hath not life. You know, that's what they wanted, the Garden of Eden, but they didn't want the God of the Garden, right? It doesn't work out that way. When they, le when they rebelled, they left their life source. And without our life source, there is no life. And that's how people walk. That's how people live. That's why a lot of people turn to addictions. That's why a lot of people turn to immorality. That's why you, you see these rich and famous people. Like, remember when Tiger Woods, who was like the greatest golf player, golfer ever lived and he was so rich he had a supermodel for a wife and then yet he's going after all these other women and all these other things and you're thinking what's going on they can't find it in these temporal things and they're con they will continue to search and what are they looking for they're looking for jesus but they're looking in all the wrong places and yet they're afraid why because the devil has sold people on a lie he's the master liar the father of lies the fearful unbelieving and the abominable abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and some people say well i'm glad i'm not one of those things which if we really understood what the bible says if we hate someone without cause it is the same as murder it's just we didn't commit the act but it was in our heart or if we look at a woman to lust after we've committed adultery already even though you didn't do the act but it's in your heart in other words it's still a sin now that's not to excuse and say well i did it in my heart I might as well do the act no the consequence is going to be far more severe but it's still a sin to god but then he also covers another sin that we are all guilty of. It is the common denominator of sin. And you know what that is, right? A lie. Look what he says. And all liars. That covers everybody, right? Because there's nobody that I think would, would say with, with a straight face that I've never lied. Just that would be a lie right there. So all liars, in other words, nobody can make it into heaven unless they receive Jesus Christ. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. First death, physical death, 
Second death is going to hell. Death is separation. And when someone dies, we're separated from them. When someone dies spiritually, they're separated from God and all other believers. So that's the first point. A brand new world. Now we see a bright new city. Wow, do we have to do this in the afternoon service? No. We'll see all we get. We'll see how far we get. Verse 9 to 27. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me. So the same one we talked about the plagues that we looked at. Talked with me, saying, come hither. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So this is how they get that, right? It is called the bride, the lamb's wife, because it is a place where all God's people are gathered. In this sense, now he's seen a preview. John is looking at the future and he's writing down all of these things. So he says, I'm going to show you the bride, the lamb's wife. This is where we will be living. So he's saying, this is the bride. So people are saying, oh, the city's the bride. That's how they get that. But that's not, that's not what's in view here. I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. In the, news, in, the, in the sense... In this sense, the new Jerusalem is certainly like the bride because of its beauty, but this is the place where the bride of Christ will live forever. Verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And the, jas- the jasper stone in the New Testament is the same thing what, what, we would con- what we would call a diamond. So it's a diamond, which is clear as crystal. And then also when the light hits a diamond, you ever see a real valuable diamond or one that has that, uh, high, the high clarity? And then you shine a light into it and it just has all its colors of like the rainbow that disperses and it's so beautiful. That's the way heaven is going to be. A jasper stone, clear and crystal. And it also speaks of the fact, because you know what a diamond is. A diamond basically is coal. It is just, I mean, a lump of coal which is worthless. But when you put pressure on it and heat and pressure and heat for a long period of time, it turns into a diamond. So that's what God has done with us. That's the place where we're going to be living. And it speaks of the, uh, the testimony of what God has done to his glory, not ours, that he's taken just a lump of coal and through time and pressure. And we go through things that sometimes put pressure on us. And we go through times, we go through trial, and God is turning us into a diamond that we're going to live in heaven, a place where it's going to be a testimony of what God has done in our life. Romans 8, verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Then it says in verse 12, And had a great, and had a wall great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names written thereon. You know, you're talking about the the gates, but no mention of Peter. Every time people will talk about that, when you come to heaven and you're going to see Peter, (laughs) does it? Doesn't, doesn't, Doesn't mention Peter's name. Although, well, let me read on. And names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So when you, so so to get access to the city, you go through the gates, just like any city, there's gates. And you go through the gates that gives you access to the city. And the testimony of access is written on the gates with the names of the tribes of Israel. Because that's how we gain access is because of the covenant that God has made with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. And the covenant that God made with the, with the Jewish nation. And that's how we get access. Because of what God has done. And he's used the nation of Israel. And that's still the testimony in heaven. That's how you gain access. So there's, 
you know, people that are uh, believe in replacement theology that God is done with Israel. And yet, I don't know what they do with these these verses that God is has, still has a place in his heart for the nation of Israel. And, of course, the 12 tribes, which are the name of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. Do you know that we are, we as Gentiles are grafted in? It says in Romans chapter 11, verse 17 through 19, and I also read verse 25, it says, And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. You notice how whenever God says, or whenever it says in the Bible, Apostle Paul says several times not to be ignorant of this. And that's the thing that people today seems like in Christianity are the most ignorant of. This is one of the things when it comes to uh, Israel and what we would call replacement theology, or that God is finished with Israel because now the church ha- is now the new Israel. And and so God has no dealings now with the nation of Israel because they rebelled. That's Now, we understand that we as a church are grafted in. Yes, I believe that. But I also believe that God still has a plan for Israel. And it says in Romans 11 that all Israel shall be saved. You cannot interchange Israel and the church there because it says that that Israel was enemies of the Lord. So that's not the church. So we, we know that God still has a plan. And we talked about this in the tribulation period. Two thirds of the nation of Israel is going to be killed. One third is, is going to survive. And that one third is all going to be saved. That is all true or real Israel because they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And they will be saved. And the Bible says that. Not just there, but also in Zechariah chapter 14. They're going to look upon him in whom they pierced. And they're going to mourn for him as one that mourneth for his only begotten son. And they're going to receive Jesus Christ as their Messiah at the end of the tribulation period. And if you don't believe that, you have to twist Romans. You have to twist and allegorize a lot of the uh, minor prophets. You're going to have to allegorize and symbolize the book of revelation and then you're going to tell people don't even read it because it cannot you can't understand it it's 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 over your head and that's a lot of time the covenant theologians and the and uh, and the uh, replacement theology people who believe that you know there's you know still friends of ours but don't believe i don't believe that at all so we see that the names but then also verse 14 the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. We enter in because of the covenant that the Lord made with Israel, but the foundation of our faith are the apostles which are founded upon Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. He was the stone that the builders rejected. Remember that? That the stone that the builders rejected, the same became the head of the corner. That, and there's a story, and, and, and uh, I don't know if this story is true or not, but a lot of people say that this is a true story. That when they were building the temple, that the cornerstone was, uh, w- was delivered. So, well, they were looking for it and came to the, the time where they're thinking, where's the cornerstone? Because, you know, that's the stone that's going to be able to make things, everything straight. You know, this way, that way, and, you know, you need that cornerstone. Like today, you know, when you're trying to make a wall straight or you're trying to make it into a perfect square, you got to use that Pythagorean theorem, you know, and you got to make it in, in measure and this and that. But over there, those days, they had a cornerstone, and it would make it straight in all directions. And they needed that, that stone. So they're asking for it. When are they going to send the cornerstone? When are they going to send the stone? And then they, um, they didn't have cell phones back then, so they would send the messengers. And the messengers go over there and comes back, and they're like, we sent the stone. We sent it weeks ago. They're like, what? They come back. They sent the stone already. They go, no, we didn't see no stone. So they went back again, and they're going back and forth, and they had drew like a description of it. They brought it back, and they go, that, that was the cornerstone? Man, we thought that was a mistake. We rode it down the hill. And they had to go back down. They had to go down the hill, and they had to bring that. The, the, and that's what the Bible says. The stone that the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. And that's what 
That's what Israel did, right? They rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And today in Israel, they're looking for a false Messiah. They've rejected the true Messiah, which if you, anybody does this, if you reject Jesus Christ, you open up yourself to the devil. And because they rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah, they are going to accept the Antichrist as their Messiah. They're looking for him right now. And all he got to be is what they're looking for. And that's not hard. And that's what he's going to do. And they're going to receive him as, and they're going to make a covenant with him, which is going to begin the tribulation period. So the city has foundations. Now, this is what Abraham did. It says in, in Hebrews 11, verse 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterwards receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He set his eyes up upon heaven a place as it says here a place that has 12 foundations and if we can get a little bit of understanding that abraham had that will change our life you notice how it says that he dwelt in tents because he knew this only temporary he didn't root himself the only plot of land that he ever owned was a plot of land for a cemetery <laughs> He said, that's all it's good for. And really, that's the truth. All we're ever, you know, when we're dead and gone, we're going to be in a, and some people are just scattered in ashes, you know, but I mean, if, if you're buried, you're going to have this, just this much, you know. Well, I don't have a house. I don't have any land in Hawaii. You're going to have this much later on. It's a, it's, that's all you're going to need, right? Because this world is not our home. And he understood that. He looked for a city. He kept his eyes on heaven. And no matter what happened to him on this earth, he knows that we're, I'm just passing through. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be up there forever. And so he just lived in tents. Man, we should just sell all our houses and just buy tents. That's what we should do. <laughs> if you would like to sell, let me know. I'll let you talk to my realtor. You know? <laughs> and then we can make arrangements. And you can live in the tents and we'll live in the houses. No. You ever see those cult people that kind of get people to sell stuff and then they take everybody's stuff? Yeah, I'm not going to do that. But, you know, we live in Hawaii where, what is it, like a million dollars for a house now? I mean, it gets to the point if you don't have a house by now. I mean, the Lord could do anything, don't get me wrong, but it's expensive. But if you never get to buy a house down in this earth, you have a mansion in heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. And if you're looking to buy plots, to so have someone I can refer you to, you know, they're selling. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> That's what he looked for. And if we could do what he did, it'll really encourage us in our life. Verse 15. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof, and the city lie at four square, and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. So it's a cube. It is a 1,500-mile cube. You know that's as far as Maine to Florida? That's far. And it's like from the um, east coast to like the middle, like Colorado. It's big. But it's a cube, so we think of it just flat and square. I mean, just like uh, outlining a square, but it's a cube, so it's also that high. So if you were to kind of like divide it up, if you were to divide it up into, let's say, 7,900 layers of 1,000-foot ceilings, we don't know how how if it's going to be divided that way, but if you could, let's say, I mean, a thousand foot ceiling is a high ceiling. That's high. I mean, imagine how many floors that would be just on that one section. If it was divided that way, if it was divided that way, the amount of square footage would cover 89 Earth's landmass. That's a lot of area. If there are 4 billion people in the New Jerusalem, do you know there's over 90% of the population that ever lived alive today? There, of all the people that's ever lived, 90% are alive today, 90 plus percent. 
what is there like what seven billion seven and a half billion people and about 90 plus percent maybe 90 something 95 or so percent of the people that's ever lived is alive today so of all the people that are alive today or that's ever lived of that percentage, how many people actually trusted Christ as Savior? How many of those people are going to heaven? If there was at least, let's say, four billion to be conservative, we would all get 2,800 acres of land if it was divided that way. In other words, it's huge. There's not going to be any, um, what is that they call when there's too many people? Overpopulation. There's not going to be any overpopulation in heaven. By the way, there's not any overpopulation on earth either so people think that's overpopulated you could fit the entire world's population in the in the um, state of colorado and everybody would get an acre the world is not and if you think the world is overpopulated drive through utah and the signs if the sign says three there's not going to be any gas any gas station for 300 miles they're not just trying to get you to go to their gas station it's true i mean maybe they put a few more in since we've been up there but you're just, man, it's like, you better put gas now. And it's that way. There's, there's not much going on in Utah, I tell you, in most of the state. It's just land. We were just going through, we, we took a drive yesterday, and we're going through the middle of the, of the um, island. And there were some places I thought, man, there's a lot of land in here. <laughs> How come we can't put houses over here or put all the local people, get them, you know, nice houses over in this land? I mean, what's, it just seemed like a lot of land to me. I don't know. But in heaven, there's a lot of space. And that's just a city. That's just, I mean, there's places to travel all over the galaxy. Some say we'll be able to travel by speed of thought. That's pretty fast. Speed of light is fast. I wonder how the speed of thought. I mean, some people are probably faster than others, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. So you might be able to travel somewhere and then, you know, Farrington grad person probably get there an hour after you get there. No, nah, just just joking. I don't want to get beat up by a Farrington person. <laughs> oh, yeah, Peter and Farrington are very quiet, yeah. I thought just Judith was. <laughs> you killing what, Olamana? She'd probably be there real quick, yeah. She'd better, she better be there before the Kamehameha person. <laughs> They're still trying to argue with someone about how to say the name right. Kamehameha. Make sure you say it. Pronounce all the letters. And he measured the wall thereof in 140 and four cubits according to the measure of a man. That's the wall. And which is a 216 feet. That's small compared to how tall the city is. And the building of the wall of it was jasper. And the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. You know, we talk about gold. I mean, gold, what is it an ounce? It's kind of a lot, yeah. Nobody knows, huh? We don't care about gold, I guess. <laughs> you know how much it's worth in heaven? What is asphalt worth down on, on earth? How much is asphalt for a pound? A pound of asphalt. To be honest with you, I'd like to have a bunch of asphalt down in the front of the driveway. <laughs> We're trying to get that. I don't know if anybody noticed the huge holes, but... <laughs> I've hit them a couple of times. I don't know. We put gravel in, but it doesn't, you know, only last. But asphalt in heaven, I mean, gold is asphalt in heaven. It's building material. The city's made out of it, and, and it's a lot higher quality of gold. It's so pure, it's clear. You can see through it. Now, on earth, we think gold is pretty valuable. You know, like we bought a ring the other day for one of our children, and just a little ring like this, Pretty similar to this ring was a thousand dollars. Just little like that. Gold is so valuable on this earth, but in heaven, it's just asphalt. If you go to heaven, would you like to get a ring, a, a chain, a big chain of asphalt? <laughs> <laughs> but if you got a extra chain of gold and if you have an actual one you'd like to give it to me i would love to have one <laughs> can you imagine me sitting up here preaching with that <laughs> <laughs> i 
then you'd think you'd know that ah, it's fake. The one pastor has this fake guarantee. <laughs> but in heaven, they build with it. And yet, it's clear. The building of the wall of it was of it of Jasper, the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second sapphire, the third a Chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardonyx, the sixth a sardius, the seventh a chrysolite, and the eighth a beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysoprasis, and the eleventh a jasnith, and the twelfth an amethyst. These correspond to the stones on the high priest's breastplate. When he went into the Holy of Holies and he carried these stones, it represented each tribe's, and there's a message in that that I wanted to bring out this afternoon. Verse 21, and 12 gates were 12 pearls, the pearly gates. And that speaks of, every time you see it, it, it'll remind someone of what God has done. You know what a pearl is? It is, you know when an oyster makes a pearl? Sometimes it is a, a, like a grain of sand stuck in there. And it just kind of irritates it. And so it just kind of like keeps covering it with stuff. And it could even be a, a worm, like a parasite or something. Something that is just an irritant, and it covers that, covers it and covers it and covers it, and then it makes a pearl. And that beautiful pearl is a result of something that was just an irritant. You know, and that's, what, that's a testimony of what God has done with us. We were just a little irritant, and yet because we're covered with the blood of Jesus, God made pearls out of that. And that's, what, that's a testimony of what God is. A pearl is a testimony of us as believers. This is not about Jesus. We are the pearl of great price in the Bible. The, the pearly gates. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the streets of the, the streets of the city was pure gold, like I said, asphalt. As it were, transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And, the, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but only they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Conclusion, the Bible says, I, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have, en have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. We can't fully comprehend what God is, has prepared for us. But Jesus did say, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. When we get a glimpse of heaven, we will get our priorities right. We will be encouraged, and we will point people to Christ. And we will live for eternity. In heaven, there's no pain, no death, no goodbyes, no endings, and no limits. Heaven is going to be far better than we could ever imagine. You know, we think about heaven, all the beautiful things. You know, on this earth, I was talking to Roxanne about this uh, uh, last night. You know, when you have like a wedding and your family comes, you know, we had a lot of family come and it was a blessing and honor to have them, you know, sacrifice and spend the money to, to fly over here for our daughter's wedding. I mean, you can't always, you know, sometimes the schedule doesn't allow it, but when people do that and then you see them, you pick them up at the airport, you always want to go to the place where it's arrivals, you know. You pick up, you know, Roxanne's parents came in. Um, uh, my sister Miley, she, in fact, she's here this morning. My brother, he came in. I haven't seen him in a long time. Uh, my daughter Kylie came in. And, you know, others, you know, you always people coming in. And then what happens? Then they leave. You know, hello, then goodbye. Hello, goodbye. 
coming, going. I remember that all my life. You know, people coming in for things and then leaving. Or sometimes you will show up for something and then you will leave. And you're always saying hello and goodbye. You know, in heaven, there's not going to be any more goodbyes. I mean, who likes goodbyes? You know, my brother left last night, you know, and it's goodbye. And I told Roxanne, I says, you never know. You never know when you say goodbye. That may be the last time you say goodbye. And not to be negative, but that's just a reality. We always got to remember that. We may say goodbye to someone for the very last time, but not in heaven. When we get to heaven, there will be no more goodbyes. In fact, there's going to come a time in heaven where God wipes away from our mind all the past, everything negative. It's going to be done. And that's why he says that the sufferings we face in this present time is not even worthy. Hey, you might have had a bad past. You might have, had a, uh, you might have done some things you regret. We, we all have. And you might have had some things happen to you that you felt like you did not deserve. You may have been abused. You have, even it could, could have been uh, uh, mistreated in a great, great way. But when we get to heaven, and if, if you have received Jesus Christ, it's worth it all. Because we're, no matter what it took, sometimes the difficult things that have happened to us have pointed us to Christ because of the difficulties we're facing and the emptiness we had inside. But if you're in heaven for just one split second, everything that's happened to you in the past, it's all good. Because we're going to be in heaven with Jesus for all of eternity and we'll never say goodbye to anyone there ever again. That's why we want to make sure nobody misses it, right? That's why we want to make sure our loved ones don't miss it. That's why we want to make sure that no one in this room misses it. That's why we, we still have time. We don't know how much time. But that's why Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. What is he saying? Once we get past once we go from this side of eternity to the other side, can't win anybody to Christ. You have to do it now while we still have a chance. Would you bow our heads and close your eyes? Heads bowed.